The following program is presented by the HTM Podcast Network. This is your United States of America. Monday, July 29th, 2019, and you are tuned into the simulcast of the Hitting the Marks Pro Wrestling Podcast, powered by the Roar Network at thegorillaposition.com. Presented in simulcast is your Monday locker room at Hami Media. <laughs> And in association with Last Word on ProWrestling.com. On this week's show, we're talking the WWE financials, your G1 Climax update, as well as your Raw and SmackDown previews. But before we dive in, it's my obligation to remind you this is a podcast by the fans for the fans, bringing you all the news that is news from across the professional wrestling world. Find the entire HTM podcast network online, hittingthemarks.com, and the entire Hameen Media Group online, hackerhameen.podbean.com. My name is Jargo. I'll be your host for the day, but give it up for my tag team partner. He's the Sergeant Slaughter to my Iron Sheik, RBV. Rick, welcome back to your show, and welcome back inside the locker room. It's me, it's me. It's that order of the B to the V, Rick Vickery. Man, it feels like it's been forever. But I'm glad to be back on the air, especially here inside the locker room with the Hameen Media Group. But, Jarrah, I guess we got a little crossover, right? Yeah, we're going to simulcast this week. We, we didn't have an opportunity to hook up over the course of the weekend. You had an absolutely insane weekend. I had an absolutely insane week. Um, so we're going to simulcast this on the Hitting the Marks podcast network as well as the Monday locker room for HackerHameen.Podbean.com. Um, but like I said, man, you had an absolutely insane weekend. Tell the people what you were doing. Well, I, you know, I just want to make sure where we were at, if we were in the hitting the March pro wrestling podcast, if we're in the locker room, should I be wearing a red shirt, a blue shirt? Does it even matter anymore? What Wild brand card. We're on. Wild card. Wild card. Wild card, bitches. Uh, Majorca, you're exactly right. What an incredible weekend ahead an experience, uh, beyond my wildest dreams that, you know, just. Everything, you know, I was reflecting yesterday. I sat back, I put out a post on social media at the real RBV. I was looking at, you know, it's almost going to be two years to today that we began this, this wild journey of ours that we dubbed the Hitting the Marks Pro Wrestling Podcast. We got into the podcast game and, and almost within weeks after launching our show, you know, Big Ray Hernandez reached out to us. He wanted us to sit down and meet with Ben Hameen. They were starting something very special. They were expanding the Hameen Media Group. They wanted us to be a part of that. They wanted, they wanted you and me to be you know, the first ones out of the gate each and every week right here on Mondays to get the thing going, get everybody excited, get, get the place fired up with an incredible lineup, an incredible lineup of shows. And back then, we were, what did we start off with? Maybe like four shows, four or five shows. And, and now all this program that we've got, and, you know, just on our end of it, the Hitting the hitting Marks Pro Wrestling Podcast, that's expanded to HittingTheMarks.com. We've got so much content going on, so many tremendous personalities. And through all of that, through all of that, I was able to to meet Denim Blevins with Battle on the Border Pro Wrestling. Began working with them a little over a year ago. And I found my way into the into the booth, doing play-by-play, and now expanding here. Legends of the Squared Circle Pro Wrestling gave me an opportunity. What an opportunity that was to call a match. They call them, that's just not a match. They call them matches at the famed Bogarts Music Hall in Cincinnati, Ohio. In top to bottom, an incredible lineup. Former WWE stars, former TNA stars, internationally known names, some of the hottest local talent in a main event that I would put up there against anything on the globe. Something that was very special to me to call the match between, you know, the legendary trainer, the Hall of Famer, taking on the international cult classic. It was Cody Hawk versus Shark Boy. Unbelievable weekend. Unbelievable experience. Very, very cool, man. We, uh, 
I, I of course was at home with the wife and kids. We we're, we've been dealing with some stuff around here. Um, but this weekend was actually the Hall of Fame induction at the uh, Thagos Thez Hall of Fame up in Waterloo, Iowa. So getting a little bit of press here. Um, and and one of the things that came out of that was this interview with Sergeant Slaughter that I heard with Wade Keller, and it got me to thinking. William Alicia had put up a post in the Hamian Media discussion group here just a couple of weeks ago about kayfabe in 2019 and listening to sergeant slaughter tell some of these stories man was just absolutely insane i absolutely recommend going out and finding that podcast but he goes out and he's buying you know cadillac limousines and getting them painted camouflage truly living the gimmick and which we don't see that in a 2019 context rick can that even exist inside of a 2019 context well, you know, I love that you got this conversation on the run here. The thread that was put up there by, by William Alicia, it sparked some great debate, some great conversation. And it's something you know, that I've been pondering on for quite some time. And everybody wants to, you know, write it off. It's dead. It doesn't exist. Forget about it. I don't buy into that. Now, I used to be so hard on it where, yeah, you know, I, I thought that individuals should live their gimmick, you know, just try as much as you can. I know it's unavoidable with the age that we're living in here, you know, with social media and, and where everybody's got their cameras out. You know, it, whatever, everything you're doing is being monitored. It, it, but I thought it was, it was so important to live by that. And there was a conversation that we had with Women of Honor champion Kelly Klein where, you know, she brought up that point, you know, you can live both of those worlds. You, you can be that badass in the ring. When it comes down to it, you're all business, but there can be another side of you that you can sell on social media. And the way that she presented it and respecting both of those worlds, it made so much sense and it made me sway a little bit. But I still think that there is still value in holding true to KFAM. And it's not so much in the sense of, you know, what you mentioned there with Sergeant Slaughter going out and buying the Cadillacs and having them painted or, uh, one of his great rivals, as you talked about the top of the show, the Iron Sheep, were, I mean, damn near riots would ensue because, uh, you know, the intensity and how people felt towards him in each city, each arena that he'd go to, or someone, you know, like Ric Flair, you know, the horsemen, how they rolled together, they lived that lifestyle, the million dollar man who had to, who had to put on that front, you know, that, that, you know, that's who he was, not necessarily, not necessarily there, but can it evolve? And by evolving, where you, the, the persona, they always said, you know, you turn it up to 10, you rip the knob off. Is there a medium ground where now we need to start looking at, okay, these are who these individuals are in real life. Let's start catering these personas on air more towards that and come to a common ground where we can evolve KFAB, where there is that middle ground where we can continue to blur those lines and keep people on their toes. Well, isn't that kind of where Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch are at at this point? I mean, like, it, it, Seth Rollins is the one that just comes to mind because I heard a Stone Cold on a podcast quite a while back where he's like, who is Seth Rollins? Like, what is his character? Well, at this point, his character is he's Seth Rollins. Like, isn't that kind of where we're at? Okay, with this, do you really get the sense that of what you're seeing, especially now, uh, that we're seeing Seth Rollins trying to step up and uh, no pun intended here to be the man representing WWE. Do you really get the sense he is who he is portraying himself as on social media in some of these interviews? No, not at all. Not at all. And I, and I just say that coming from the same area and knowing a lot of the same people, you know, like, no, that's that's certainly not the individual that we're seeing. And I get maybe where they're going with him right now. It is more, it's building towards that, that slow turn. We're getting that slow burn for that turn. You know, he's just trying to get people kind of against him, but it, it doesn't seem natural. It almost seems, you know, going back before the cancer announcement where everything felt so forced with Roman. And then we got the, you know, you know, when the, uh, the devastating announcement was made, it pulled back that curtain and you got to see Joe and people, you know, even outside of the cancer, they, they could relate with Joe instead of Roman. And, and now they're blurring those lines a little bit. Well, then it, it, I, I was listening to another podcast. Of course, it's called 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff. This week's episode, it's all about Scott Steiner. And they get to this conversation about the February 17th of 1997 episode of Nitro. And it's Hall and Nash are in a car 
and they run the Steiners off the road, causing a car accident, right? And that's part of the angle leading up to this. And Bischoff explains how he got so much shit for this angle. And Bischoff just goes on this tirade about how he doesn't understand why there's these unwritten rules of like what you can and what you can't do in wrestling. Because at this point, we all realize this is a scripted television show. And why can't I do what is on every other scripted television show and shoot it just like every other scripted television show? Why do I got to play by these phony rules? And it's it's kind of the world of professional wrestling. Like, we, we, we want it both ways now. Like, we want the kayfabe, but now more than ever, we're seeing the people that are playing these characters out in the media, on social media, and not necessarily being the character. And Rick, I can't help but wonder, is it time to start rolling credits? Is it time to separate the the wrestler themselves from the character that they're playing? Is that the, really the only answer to kayfabe in 2019? Uh, I can see where Mr. Bischoff's coming from here. But I think one of the things that makes pro wrestling so special is those differences, that it is held to a different standard. You want something that's going to blur the line between sports and entertainment. You, you want to walk that fine line. You don't want to go to the extreme either way. And I think that's something that has always made professional wrestling so special. And I, I, I Also, I can't help but Bischoff brought up, you know, that why can't we do this? And I can't help but point out that it has been done, right? Like Impact Wrestling has done this. I, we criticize the hell out of it when they do the Undead Realm, when they had the OGs run over a little kid. We praise the hell out of it when they did the Broken Universe. I mean, isn't that basically what we're talking about here? And Lucha Underground is like the extreme of it, right? And this is all a conversation because AEW is getting ready to launch in just a matter of weeks at this point on TNT, and they're under the TNT drama umbrella. And I can't help but wonder, like, what would this TV show look like? Would, would it be more like these Road 2 Double or Nothings are freaking incredible, the way that they shoot them, the way that it's presented. It's in a much more cinematic, sort of viewing experience myself and Matthew Schaefer Gage from the impact attack had this conversation forever ago about shooting professional wrestling from a more cinematic kind of viewpoint. And in a way that's what Lucha underground really, really was. And I think that's why people loved Lucha underground because it was so different. It was a true alternative. The problem was it was on the L Ray network and nobody got to see it. And it was built around Lucha Libre, but could a show like that work? For AEW? Well, I'm glad that you brought up, you know, Lucha Underground there. And you're right, you know, they, it did have that cult following. Those individuals that were invested in, in it, they absolutely loved it. Uh, it. It was feeding all their consumer needs, but it was such a small sample group. Now, I don't know if we just chalk that up simply to to it being on, you know, the, L, the LRA network where it was only going to reach so many, so many eyes, so many consumers. Or was was there a, such a marketplace? I mean, why did they get a bigger platform? Was were there individuals that hungry for that style of professional wrestling? We we go back to that overall conversation, and you can you, you could you can plug out, you can pluck wrestling out, and plug anything else in any other kind of industry. We look at that consumer base. Is there a wide enough audience that is hungry enough for it, or is it we go back to a case of where consumers are just used to you know what they know. They're used to the norm and anything that's going to stray so far drastically away from WWE is going to freak them out. I think there's something to it, man. And I, I think part of the problem with Lucha Underground absolutely was El Rey Network and the reach that it had. But I also think the other problem was it's Lucha. Like Lucha has never caught on in the United States like it has in Mexico, no matter how hard they try to push it. it. There is a ceiling on Lucha. I would be interested to see an actual pro wrestling promotion try to pull off that cinematic kind of presentation that Lucha Underground had just without the Lucha or the Underground. Well, you know, one of the styles there, and maybe it was because it's everybody out there that's listened to these shows. They know I'm not the biggest Lucha fan. And when it came to Lucha Underground, maybe more outside of that, when I would tune into it, I just saw a drama television show that happened to have professional wrestling in it. 
And that's what I'm saying with AEW. Could they pull that off under the TNT drama umbrella? Well, I mean, you're looking at that extreme, or I want to throw, you know, on the other side of the coin here, let's go to the other side where it's more sports, something that, you know, since we started doing this podcast game, you've turned me on to, you've been into it for, hell, years, decades, whatever it might be, and it's going more towards the true sports presentation that you see in Japan. And I think that could absolutely play into it because when you read that press release for announcing the AEW TV show, which we haven't had a chance to talk about at all yet, it actually says they're going to be presenting matches, not you know presenting a television show, that they're going to be presenting matches, which makes me wonder, like, are we going to get kind of like, uh, gosh, I don't know how to explain it. If you want to see the post-game interviews for an NFL game, you have to tune in either to a different show or you have to go online and find them. Are we just going to get the game itself? Is it just going to be wrestling matches presented in a two-hour format? Well, this and then you run into another situation here. I was actually having this conversation with one of our great listeners, Kevin Mize, the other day. And, and you know, he was asking me, he's like, man, you, you consume so much professional wrestling He's like, you know, but someone for him, you know, he just wants to sit down, grab the remote. He even came out and said, he's like, I don't know if I had the time or if it's maybe just the will to go find all these other outlets. So he's not up to speed with everything AEW because he's not sitting there surfing for everything. He's not going out of his way to find their social media. And, and on top of that, you know, it's the same with MLW. They got to go out of their way to find the, these certain programs. Even with Impact Wrestling, most people are now watching that through Twitch how many consumers are going to go out of the way? And, and I know as, as the era that we're living in here, everyone's moving more towards digital. You got all these different streaming services. We're consuming everything through online, online platforms, but how many are truly making that transition right now? And how much of this base that's watching professional wrestling has just been so trained. You pick up the remote, you turn on USA, you turn on Fox, you turn on whatever channel that they're not going to go out of their way to find those kinds of, you know, the interviews or the, the storylines through social media. You know, the one argument that I'm just not getting is, well, what about the, the channel flippers? Does anybody channel flip anymore? Like you, you go looking for a certain channel. Like, does anybody not have a guide? Is anybody sitting there with the channel up and channel down still? That's an interesting point as well there, Jargo. You know, are you actually just, are you surfing through the guide or like I'll flip away, especially believe, I mean, you don't have to sit through most of them unless you have an off night, but I'll flip away from raw or SmackDown, but I know where I'm going. I know what else is on. I know the Simpsons are running against raw or SmackDown. I'm flipping over to FXX. I know if South Park's running, that's where I'm going. I know what's on adult swim or TBS. I, I know the other destinations I want to head towards. If there's a big game, I know I want to go to ESPN or whatever it might be. I'm not sitting there saying, okay, you know what? Okay, let me just see what's on VH1, what's on MTV, blah, 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 anything like that. I know my other destinations. Yeah. Uh, and, and all this also arises as WWE is trying to figure out how to format their TV show. I thought this was an interesting quote coming from Vince McMahon on the WWE quarterly financial call. He says, we're going to go a bit edgier, but remain in the PG environment. At the same time, we're not going back to go back to the attitude era. We're not going to do blood and guts and things of that nature, such as is being done perhaps by a new competitor. We're just going to, we're not going back to that old gory crap that we've graduated from. It's a more sophisticated product, whatever the hell sophisticated product means, but he's throwing some shade at AEW here. And I think more importantly, and Rick, I'm sure this stood out to you too. know your audience, right? This is being spoken to advertisers. He wants the advertisers to stay with WWE and not go and advertise on TNT and with AEW. You know, what's very interesting. What, what jumps off the page here to me and, and immediately in, and obviously you're right. You know, he's talking to his investors. He's trying to reassure his stockholders. He's talking to the advertisers. He's talking to those networks. But as he talks about being an edgier product and I look at the team he's assembled and all the names that we've seen WWE sign and just not the talent, you know, those individuals they brought for, you know, backstage hands. 
know, that we're going with Heyman now, seemingly for Raw. And, and Mr. Bischoff's going to have some kind of influence. He's going to have some kind of handlings over with SmackDown. They brought Jared, Abyss, uh, Hurricane, all these people that, that, that we've heard that are going in. Pritchard, you know, that they're going to be in these management roles or, you know, producers, things like that. That's an old regime. Do they know what's edgy, what is cool for arguably what would be the target audience for this young demographic? Or did they bring them back to, to just speak to individuals like me and you that are in those late 30s, 40s in that demographic were opposed to AEW where some of the things we don't get but those guys are speaking to those 20 somethings. Is that the line that's being drawn? Is that where the battle lines are going? Are they setting themselves up to hit those different targets? And in, in my business, in marketing, some of the clients that, that I have, if they want to run nightly promotions, you know, they want to have the bar going, they want to get it hopping from like 9 PM until two 30 Eastern. I have to, I have to refer to someone else. I have to ask those young kids, you know, what is going to work here? You guys lay it out for me. Then let me design it. Let me promote it because I sure as hell don't know what's going to draw. I don't know what's happened right then. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm an old guy right now. I'm in my forties. I might like to think I'm cool. I can still run with those people, but I don't know what they're into. So you got to refer to those individuals. Do you believe that Vince and who is he the line himself with? Do they know what edgy is right now? I mean, we see it all the time. The references they make sometimes, you know, they're going early nineties, even individuals like me and you were scratching our heads like, really? I even forgot about that. Yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of out there. Let's take a look at some of these numbers. We, we finally got the quarterly financials. Those came across last week. Raw ratings down 11% versus 2018. In the first quarter, they were down 14%. So they actually tried to spin this like it was a good thing that they were down only 11% in the second quarter. No surprise there, though. SmackDown ratings down 7% versus 2018. First quarter, they were down 13%. They were also very, very quick to point out that the 7% decline was right within that top 25 cable network trend. Just about everything is down right now, about 7%. Rick, do you make anything out of these? I mean, none of this is any surprise to me. Well, I don't think there's anything. Nothing's really jumping off the page so far. I mean, these, these numbers are down. Uh, I assume we're going to get to hear this network, these network subscription drop off. Uh, I think that was something that, that should be very alarming to them. And they're trying to write it off. But, but in all honesty, I mean, they're not going to come out here and they're not going to go panic mode in front of everybody. You, you want to put a positive twist on anything that you're presenting there. Although, you know, that might be a different story behind closed doors. Digital consumption up 23%. That, of course, is all your YouTube and Twitter and, and digital videos that don't bring them any money. But, you know, that metric is always up. So they love to tout it. it, it that's the one that they always put out there. I think this is a bad number. This, this is people that are just no longer watching the show. Again, you know, is, is they're going to they're gonna beat their chest. It's something they can be proud of. They see that rise. What do you say? They're up 23% on that? Yep. But, but there's an alarming issue there as well. You know, we just had that conversation. Are people going to go out of their way to find this thing? WWE is a, a little bit, is a different kind of beast where because it is so known, it's established that people are still interested and kind of just seeing what's happening there because you get the perception that if you're there, you are the absolute best in the world. So people just by nature want to check out what's happening there. But the bigger issue is, as drunk as you regularly point out, as you just mentioned, you're making essentially squat on this thing. Yeah, it's, it's pennies on the dollar compared to the television rights. You're getting a little bit of revenue, but it doesn't mean anything in the grand scheme of things. And, and what it's more telling is, as you look at your ratings decline and you see this thing skyrocketing, it's saying that people don't, they don't, it's, it's not a necessity. It's not a must that you have to check out this programming. Jugger, you're in television. You tell me this all the time. What makes you know things like the NFL and Major League Baseball and basketball and all that so hot is the demand for live television is must-see. We're not seeing that for professional wrestling. Because people like Kevin Mize don't have five hours to devote to it a week. That's the thing. 
Every every sport in the world is trying to get shorter, except for professional wrestling, which seems that they have to put on these long marathon length shows, and that's just not the case. I'm looking forward to October when they actually split it up, and at least it's three hours on Monday and then two hours on Friday, rather than this five hours on Monday and Tuesday. Well, I, I, I think you just made an incredible point. We look across the board; every major sport sporting league is talking about. How do we quicken our game? How do we shorten the experience, get people in and out, more bang for the buck, where wrestling seems to be expanding? And we're seeing across the board, if it's through the networks, through their, you know, the, their partnership networks or their own network. I mean, WrestleMania is, you know, what is that over? I mean, it's close to eight hours during, during that Sunday. Well, and it's not just WWE. Ring of Honor does it. New Japan does it. AEW's already doing it. That's one of the things that I find so appealing about NXT. Even your big shows, two and a half hours, boom, I'm in and I'm out. And you know the look forward that you can slot yourself in. You you know the times where it's going to, you know, this thing's going to get going. And, and even with NXT, they don't make it on the, they don't try to make it seem like watching their, their kickoff show is, is a must. You know that you're just going to get your hype. They don't put you any matches on there. Where we get it, something like you know WWE. So just coming up here in the next couple of weeks uh, through Battle on the Border Pro Wrestling, we were looking at put the, putting together a viewing party, try to get everyone together, make it like a little fundraiser thing to get some things that we need for the promotion. We we're going to do a viewing party for SummerSlam. Uh, as I was trying to put that thing together, do you know the logistics of trying to play, find uh, either a restaurant that'll give you an area or even renting a spot that you're going to host a seven hour event? Right. It, it was, it's undoable. People only eat so much. People only drink so much. You, you can only afford so much from uh, one of the places that we look at because they actually carry the WWE pay-per-views and we wanted to get a party room that they have available was at a beat ups. Yeah. To rent and they usually and they only want you in those rooms like in two, three hour blocks. Yeah. So I was gonna have to reserve all these different times and then have to and then have to continue the buffet that long and then they expect people to sit and pay for drinks at a beat ups for that long. You gotta be kidding me. I mean it's undoable. And that's part of the reason why total revenue down five percent, two hundred and sixty eight point nine million versus two hundred and eighty one point six million in twenty eighteen. Rick, this was a big number that I know I was looking for and you were too. WWE paid network subscribers one point six nine million. And then you look down the revenue sheet a bit and you find network revenue down fifty six point two million to fifty two point eight. 8 million. So they lost about $5 million this quarter on the network. That's something to be alarmed about. Well, and also, you know, with this, it's just that dollar, that dollar amount dropping, uh, because they're essentially, uh, you know, they've always, they're, they've been running for a while, you know, sign up, uh, you know, first month free, but they get you locked in for that second one. So they know that you're getting your, essentially your $10 from you. But then they, you got those subscribers that have left the network. I left the network. I can, I continually get these emails about where I can get three months essentially for 33 cents a month. And then they count you as a paid subscriber. Just so they can lock in. They got that head count. They got that duck, duck, goose. They got that head count. But when it, what really matters is the financial and they're not getting anything off that end of it. Operating income down from 21.2 to 17.1, and that includes an effective tax rate decline from 20 to 25% from 31%. Live attendance down 12% in quarter one, only down 2% in quarter two. 76 total events in 2019 compared to 90 events in 2018. North American ticket sales basically flat due to a 16% increase in ticket prices. 16%! Rick, ticket price is an average ticket to a WWE show, $94.56. Attendance down 2% for an average house of $5,800. $5,800, and that includes when you figure in, uh, you know, like a WrestleMania where they draw $70,000 as the top end, that bottom end has got to be just killing them. Well, as you... As we were just talking about making the comparison to the the major sporting events, uh, the major leagues uh, that we're seeing across the board, how they're they're just not trying to to quicken the experience to try to get you in and out. They're trying to also enhance the experience. And for the listeners out there, I don't know how many of, of in from the looks of these 
numbers. Not many have, have attended a show lately. One of the things I, you know, I try to hit as many as I can, and I go there to look for different things outside of the wrestling, and it's that ultimate fan experience. And I've talked about this before. I talk about it regularly, and it's here in the locker room. It's on the Hitting Marks Pro Wrestling Podcast. Anywhere that people will give me a microphone, it, it is the disappointment in that, in that fan experience. They're not bringing it to life. They're kind of just sitting back and just, hey, we're WWE. We're, we're the top dogs. It's professional wrestling. Just come and enjoy our superstars. I've seen them make little strides where they're trying to get more fan involvement, but it's nothing like it was back when they were competing with WCW and everything was so important from the moment you step foot into an arena, they wanted you to experience something very unique, something special. They have lost their way with that. They need to get back to that. They need to, to find a way to truly enhance that fan experience and, and to make a comparison. You look at these independent promotions. If it's one I'm working for, if it's just a show I'm going to, they go overboard to make you feel so welcome, so special. And they reach out, especially you know, to those younger fans to try to hook them. Because when you've got them, when they know it's something special, they're going to want to be a part of that. They're going to bring the parents. They're going to bring the family back. That's who you need to hook. And they're going to come for... You know, for decades, they're going to they're going to come for you know as they grow, as they age, and they're going to bring their families. WWE has lost their way there, and they they need to refocus on shortening the show, keeping people happy, wanting more, and then you'll grow those numbers. You know what? The answer is not a sixteen percent ticket increase. My God, what are they thinking? Have you seen these numbers for Madison Square Garden? They're having a hard time selling tickets inside the garden. And then you look at the ticket prices and ringside seats are $2,300. Absolutely ridiculous. Uh, I, I believe, I don't think we talked about it on air. So, you know, it's been kind of hit or miss where we've been at with our schedules this week. I think we had a brief conversation off air about this. This is just, this is price spiking. This is running out there. They're trying to make up the revenue by increasing the ticket prices. Well, and, and what we're seeing is these prices that, that you're listing off here, these are original list price. And what they're doing is they're running that out there for two, three, maybe a month, hoping that they're getting some some suckers to bite on this thing. It's, it's almost like fishing. You know, they're out there chumming. And they're hoping that somebody just sinks their teeth into one of these these ridiculous hooks that they've got. But then without, you know, as soon as that fades, we're seeing these things on second market. Just they're pretty much giving these things away. Absolutely, and, and that's what's and that's and that's what's happening. So it's looking good. So when they go to investors, they go to advertisers. They're going to the networks, and they're saying these are our average ticket prices. Look what they're going for here. They're hiding that they're down on the actual attendance numbers. They're just saying this is the demand for our ticket. This is our Madison Square Garden ticket. There's other wrestling shows there that were running these things for, for 25 bucks. Can you believe that? We're getting this. But in reality, on the back end, they're either papering the town, they're giving this stuff away, or you're seeing a huge, a huge drop as soon as you get closer to gate time on what that actual price is going to be. International live event revenue declined 4 million, 14% attendance decline, average international audience 4,900. Rick, there is something going on in the UK. When they go to the UK, they are not selling out these venues all of a sudden. And that was always a surefire thing for the WWE. Not good in a market where AEW is going to have a home base over there. Well, you've got, you know, you've got the want for AEW. I'd be interested to see, you know, what New Japan is doing with their westward expansion. We, everyone kind of thinks, you know, that target is North America. We forgot about this great area in between, which is, you know, rabbit wrestling friends. I mean, they go crazy for this. They are hungry for it. Now they're getting catered to from AEW. New Japan's making that expansion. The independent scene over there, anybody who wants to keep up with that, Joe Atherton over at HittingTheMarks.com. His shows drop every Thursday. He's got everything you need to know about UK wrestling. We know how crazy they are. We know just the expansion within that area. Is WWE, is going back to what I was talking about just a moment ago, are they really in tune? Are they in touch with what's going on there? Well, and especially with NXT UK having a kind of a foothold over there now with their affiliation with ICW and Progress, you would think that they would be uh, gaining a bit more traction, not losing steam. It seems like there's a lot of bitter feelings about WWE kind of coming in and scooping up all that talent. 
but you know, there is that bitterness, you know, that they are trying to isolate where, you know, where Joe, I mean, how many great trips has he made to see so many just incredible matchups? And, you know, when, when we first met him, one of the things he was putting over, he was, he wanted to go see a lot of these matches because they were going to go away. The only way he was going to see certain talents now is going to be inside what's inside uh, the NXT UK brand. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and going back to this, everybody kind of thinks, you know, there's always this standard in within WWE, Vince, evil, it's bad, he's out of touch, Triple H, good, everything's flowing right, we can't wait till he takes over. How in touch is Triple H still with what that young audience or what that, that demographic over there really wants? Talks about it a little bit this weekend over on Hitting the Marks when uh, G1 review. Um did you hear about this Dragon Gate story that while Triple H was over there, he met with Dragon's Gate officials as well as stardom officials, and now we're hearing rumors of uh, NXT Japan, or we're hearing more rumors about NXT Canada. You make anything of that? Well, you know, and that was really the big one that jumped off the page, NXT Canada. It, you, it was you that actually posed the question. You were the first one to reply with it. Like, is that necessary? Well, you know, what's up with that? I mean, is it necessary? I mean, you kind of think NXT, the, the North American version, doesn't that just kind of, you know, doesn't that include Canada? Well, and I think it was our friend Jamie Greer over at Last Word on Pro Wrestling that said what he would anticipate would be more so like just putting a performance center up there, not necessarily have it be television. If somebody graduates from the performance center in Canada, they just go to NXT. Well, as we're talking about this this game of risk, world, you know, global domination, uh, this just kind of occurred to me here. Where they where they are placing things at is they're talking to promotions in Japan, which you know immediately goes at okay, they're looking, they're they're trying to pick off what New Japan's doing, you know, just kind of get a home base as they're looking to expand. They're trying to get in their backyard. They've already established themselves here. If we're just talking about in the UK. And they're and they're kind of consuming all of that talent, getting them on lockdown. This this Canadian movement is this more of a direct shot at impact for years? You know, they've already moved their essentially moved that home base up there, and there's been all that talk about all this repositioning. Would impact more or less claim that as their territory? Is this a shot to cut them off? Hey man, they're ruthless. They're absolutely ruthless, and I can't even fault them. Because it's it's just business, you know. It's just it's ruthless business. Well, if it, 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 if you see there's a consumer base there, and you know, it, it, I always make this comparison. I'm I'm sorry, uh, you know, but this is McDonald's again. You know, if there's a hot market, if you see that there is a base for it, they're going to open one up. Yep, and, and, and that's exactly what they do. How about outside these other partnerships? You know, you got these potentials for all these NXTs, you, you see the partnerships, you know, that continue with, uh, we're closely keeping our eye on what's going on with Ring of Honor and New Japan, but how about this? Major League Wrestling and NOAA, Pro Wrestling NOAA coming to uh, terms for a partnership. Yeah, I thought that was an absolutely big move on behalf of MLW, um, especially with their Lucha partnerships. It, it's You're really seeing those lines getting drawn with AEW and AAA and Ring of Honor and CMLL with New Japan and now we have Pro Wrestling Noah with MLW and their Lucha connections. It's cool. Well, and just everything with AEW and the grassroots campaign, all everything they got going on, that presence that's going to be with uh, Pro Wrestling Gorilla yeah. that's coming up and all that stuff. I mean, it's these battle lines are being drawn. Yeah. Well, we talked about your weekend. Let's talk about mine. It's time for your G1 Climax update. All right, Huckleberry, so here is the rundown as things stand right now inside of the A block. Kazuchika Okada leading the way with 10 points. Big win over Kenta right behind him at 8 points. Evil at 6, Ibushi at 6, Tanahashi at 6, Lance Archer, Will Ospreay at 4, Sonata and Bad Luck Fale bringing up the rear with 2 points. So I, I look at it, and I think there's about three guys left inside of the A block that I could project to win it. We've got Kazuchika Okada, Kenta, and Kota Ibushi. Uh, Okada still has Archer, Evil, Sonata, and Ibushi. 
Kenta has Fale, Osprey, Saber, and Sonata. Ibushi, Fale, Saber, Tanahashi, and of course that last night inside the Budokan against Kazuchika Okada. Huckleberry, I think this is going to come down to that last night. It's going to be Okada versus Ibushi. It's just a matter of how in the hell are we going to get there? Yeah, I mean, this thing has been a wild ride here. As we get down to this thing, do you do you think this block is Okada's or are you going with Ibushi? I'm still sticking with Ibushi, man. I look at Okada's matchups, and in order for Ibushi to catch him, right, he's two matches behind Kazushika Okada. So Ibushi has Fale, Saber, Tanahashi, and Okada being his last two matches. So I'm looking at Okada and what he's got left coming up, and I think Lance Archer is going to get Kazuchika Okada. He's going to pin the Rainmaker and earn himself a shot at the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship at King of Pro Wrestling. They like to do that storyline with Okada. It's not very often that Okada gets to play the underneath babyface, even though he's really, really good at it, because he's so much bigger than a lot of the Japanese talent. So you got to get a big gaijin in there, like Lance Archer, and Okada can actually play the underdog babyface. I think he loses to Lance Archer. Then you've got Evil, Sonata, and Ibushi. He's going to lose to Ibushi, obviously, in the final. And I think Sonata is going to get the Rainmaker. They've been telling this story with Sonata. He's 0-4 against Okada. Go ahead and give him the win inside of the G1 without the championship on the line. Sonata's only got two points. It makes his entire tournament if he just pins Okada and Ibushi just wins out. It's a tie game going into the Budokan. Well, and then you're, I mean, you're setting up here. You've got so many matches coming out of this thing. And as you're talking about Okada working is, you know, coming from under as the baby, even it, which makes up incredibly how you laid it out there with Archer. But even in those other cases, you know, he got got and he got got late in the G1. So he can still, even though as a physical being, he's bigger, he still has to overcome, you know, those upsets and the letdown, you know, on the home stretch here in the G1. And the way it lays out for Ibushi, he has to beat Hiroshi Tanahashi and Kazuchika Okada to win the A block. Like, how poetic is that? Absolutely. You know, tremendous storytelling year in and year out that we get from the G1. So let's go ahead. Let's flip things over to the B block where your dude, John Moxley, is still unbeaten inside of the G1. Huckleberry, he's got 10 points. He's two full matches up on the rest of the competition. Tomohiro Ishii and Juice Robinson at six points. Shingo, Yano, and Taichi at four points, along with Tetsuya Naito at four points. Jeff Cobb, Hiroki Goto, and Jay White. There's a whole mess of people at four points. This entire B block is just laid out for Moxley to win it, but it ain't going to happen, Rick. It's not going to happen. There's no way John Moxley is going to win this B block. Well, I'm going to tell you, you know, I, I got to love the booking here because this move, Moxley winning, you know, in this last round, beating Naito, I mean, it absolutely set the internet on fire. People are talking about this thing. It, it's bringing in other, other viewers that are just, that it weren't essentially really following with this thing. They heard that Moxley was there. Maybe they've been keeping an eye on the standings and all that. But I've had people reaching out to me. They'll ask you, what's really going on over there? Is there a chance? Is he going to run through this thing? It is, it, it's reignited the interest that we saw heading into this thing. People are, are renewed in it. They want to know what's going on. I think this is brilliant booking right now to have him as the leader of the pack. But I agree with you. It, it, it's not the time. It, it's not going to happen. And there's that one damn name that he still has to go through, that damn bastard of yours that scares the hell out of me. It's going down on Thursday, man. The state of Ohio is going to be renamed Yano. It's going to happen. Yano is going to roll a motherfucker up. John Moxley, if you watch The Road to All Out, episode number two, there's a promo with John Moxley, right? And he's talking about this matchup coming with Kenny Omega, and he says that's why he's in Japan. Because he's going over there and he's learning all about Kenny Omega. He's traveling the same roads. He's fighting all the same guys. He wants to know everything there is to know about Kenny Omega before he steps into the ring with him at All Out. It was just a great promo out of John Moxley. 
He got Tetsuya Naito, but you know what he ain't going to do? He's not going to prepare for Toru Yano because he knows Yano is a joke. He can go out there and just murder Toru Yano, and Yano's going to roll a motherfucker up. It's going to happen. As I sit out here and look out the window at this great state of ours, the OHIO, John Moxley, you cannot let this happen. I'm going to be down in your your neck of the woods here later on. I got an event to go down to go to in Norwood, your hometown, the, the little burb here in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm going to talk to the people. I'm going to get reassurance that there is no way in hell that John Moxley is going to let this happen. That absolutely not. This would be the most devastating thing to ever happen to this state. Yeah, it's going to happen, man. It's sad, but it's going to happen. Then you have Hiroki Goto. I'm not sure how that one's going to go, but he's going to lose to Juice Robinson, and he's going to lose to the Switchblade, Jay White. It's going to happen. Jay White is on a mission. He's going to win out, and this thing is going to come down to Tetsuya Naito versus the Switchblade, Jay White. Oh, yeah, that happens to be the main event inside of the Budokan on night two. Now, now, let me ask you this. You, it, you always lay this out so perfectly. Uh, you rarely get it right, though, Jarka, but you I lay know. it out beautifully. I lay it out, so man, I, I do. You know, sometimes Gato's, Gato's just like, God damn it, he knows, and he has to change something on me. You know, I want to go back to the hot name, especially here in the West, which is bringing so much attention to this, and that's Moxley. If he's going to continue this ride with New Japan, where would you see him at Wrestle Kingdom? Hmm, that's a good question. It depends if we're going to get how much we're going to get Moxley between now and Wrestle Kingdom because I was anticipating Juice Robinson is going to beat John Moxley inside of the G1, which is going to set up a United States Championship match between John Moxley and Juice Robinson. It's a matter of when does that match happen? Can you hold off on that match until Wrestle Kingdom? Very interesting. I was I was even kind of maybe thinking you know, maybe we get a merger between like the United States Championship and Intercontinental, or maybe like a champion, you know, a title for title, if you would, especially with this new dynamic that we've got with the two nights of Wrestle Kingdom. Yeah, that very well could happen. Or if Naito wins this whole thing, it could be Intercontinental Champion versus IWGP Champion because Naito wants to unify those two championships. Because I'm still sticking with what I predicted from the very beginning, which is going to be Kota Ibushi versus Tetsuya Naito in the final of the G1. Well, if you've got that there, I mean, just kind of stepping outside of that dynamic, and you, we're talking about you know almost the unthinkable. You're taking you're taking this blockbuster marquee event. You're splitting it into two nights. So you're going to need something major in each of those main events. So I mean, so what if night one you had, I mean, I mean, this would be over the top. I think that this could happen within a two night span night one. You've got the United States champion versus the intercontinental champion. And the winner there is going to claim both of those titles and also the opportunity to go on the night two, where they're going to pre- represent both of those championships versus the IWGP world heavyweight champion. So at the, at the end of this two-day little festival, you've got one individual standing there, essentially with all of the crowns. Ted C, a three belts. I could get That's an eye-opener. <laughs> I see what you did there. Naito still has Jeff Cobb. He's going to win that match. Juice Robinson, he's going to win that match. Then he's going to take on Shingo. And, Rick, I don't know if I can prepare for Shingo Takagi versus Tetsuya Naito, especially in a match that Naito has to win because you know Shingo ain't laying down for nobody. And then the second night, inside of the Budokan, it's going to be the Switchblade taking on Tetsuya Naito. Bullet Club takes on LIJ, and Naito's going to win. I hope. I really, really hope. Once again, beautifully laid out. Switchblade wins this fucking tournament. I'm going to lose my mind. Tuesday, A block matches. Ibushi versus Fale. Osprey versus Zack Sabre Jr. That's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking for Osprey to go over and challenge Zack Sabre Jr. for the Rev Pro British Heavyweight Championship at Royal Quest. Okada is going to lose to Lance Archer. I can't believe I'm saying that. Kenta versus Sonata. And Tanahashi versus Evil as your main event. Thursday, B block gets back underway 
underway. Jeff Cobb versus Shingo Takagi. Looking forward to that one. Yano versus Moxley when Huckleberry's nightmares all come true. Juice Robinson versus Tetsuya Naito. Tai Chi versus Jay White. And Tomohiro Ishii versus Roman Reigns. I mean, Hiroki Goto. Huckleberry, this looks like two nights of really, really good action. But I'm looking for upsets everywhere. And this is where we get that weird, this is where we, you know, typically each year we get that weird twist in this thing. And you laid out the standings there, Jargo. We've got so many people bunched up. It's just still anyone's game. This tournament is hot as hell. And we're not even to, you know, to that breaking point. It's just getting going. Oh, boy. I'm getting messages from Joe Atherton as we're sitting here recording today. I have breaking news from the U.K., The Grizzled Young Vets are the new Progress Tag Team Champions. Aussie Open bowing out at the end. Evidently, they are New Japan Pro Wrestling bound. That's a great pickup for New Japan Pro Wrestling. Eddie Dennis was the ring announcer saying he's only wrestling for NXT UK when he's fit again to prolong his career. So now we have Walter, the Progress and NXT UK champ. And we have the Grizzled Young Vets, Progress and NXT UK tag team champions. And this is why the natives are pissed off. There we go. Look at that breaking news as we're sitting here recording. Yeah, you, you only get... You only get this kind of coverage here inside the Monday locker room. I actually had this conversation with Big Ray yesterday. I actually, I, I, I can't even believe I said it to him. I said, hey, man, I want to let you know. We're just a little bit sorry the show gets out a little bit late. But when you have the commitment, when you're when the extensive coverage, you know, that you're going to get here, this isn't just red, blue, or dedicated towards, you know, impact wrestling. You get everything truly from around the globe. You, you, we touch on everything. What did we figure out in one week? Was it like two weeks ago that we touched on like 13 different promotions within yeah, a week? Something like that. It was absolutely ridiculous. I think we're up to like 28 since WrestleMania. It's kind of what we do. Absolutely incredible. Well, let's go ahead and throw things over to your Monday Night Raw preview. Oh, Huckleberry, I, I I don't even know where to begin. We didn't even talk about Raw Reunion. I wasn't planning on talking about the Raw Reunion. And then they had to go and pull this. Tonight on Monday Night Raw, Seth Rollins steps up to defend his newly found D-Generation X brethren, Shawn Michaels, against Dolph Ziggler and his actions from Tuesday on SmackDown. Rick, this is real life. We're getting Seth Rollins versus Dolph Ziggler for Shawn Michaels' honor tonight on Monday Night Raw. Hey, you know, but you got to defend the honor of the heartbreak kid. I'd like to remind everyone, let's talk about coming full circle. We're going into SummerSlam. Uh, This is is the go-home, correct? No. Or do we have next week? No, we've got at least one more week, right? Uh, August 13th. Yeah. So we've got another week here. Um, but I think I'm correct in saying this. Let's come full circle from a year ago. We had Seth Rollins versus Dolph Ziggler. That was the program going into SummerSlam and they were wrestling each and every week on the program heading into their Iron Man 30 man, 30 minute Iron Man match at SummerSlam. So that's where we're at. We're exactly at the same position. We were a year ago. Seth Rollins on the chase here. Uh, he's battling Dolph Ziggler now. Now instead of an Intercontinental Championship on the line, we're inserting Shawn Michaels. So I mean, what's what's the grander title, HBK or the IC Championship? Well, you know, evidently Seth Rollins is in DX now. So are you ready? That's a thing. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it looked that way from the embrace, uh, the the mimic of the curtain call, if you will, that we saw there. It looked like they were he was really included there in the group. Like, like I said, we haven't talked about the Raw reunion at all. What did you think of the OC backing down from the click? You know what? I, I actually preferred it the way that it happened. That they just got out of Dodge before they actually were embarrassed where they were eating finisher after finisher. Yeah, there is that. Tonight, we're going to have a Samoan Summit. You know, Rick, this got me to thinking. This has to be racist, right? 
I mean, like, they wouldn't have an African summit with two black guys on Monday Night Raw, would they? Like, somehow this has to be racist. Well, I, uh, so lay this out for me. What are they? What are they pitching this at? It's gonna be Roman Reigns on one side and Samoa Joe on the other side, and they're gonna have a Samoan summit. I assume this is just right, gonna thank, be thank a God. talking segment. I assume. Yeah, thank God. I thought it was gonna be like an intervention for uh, for Jay Uso or Jimmy, whichever one got in trouble. <laughs> That's tremendous. And uh, absolutely needed. My God. So I, the real question here is, how good is Samoa Joe? Can Samoa Joe pull something out of Roman Reigns that has been missing basically since he returned to the WWE? And that is any kind of fire whatsoever. Roman just seems to me like he's just kind of there and going through the motions. Wasn't this the program? I know it wasn't the SummerSlam match. But wasn't this the program just before SummerSlam for Roman Reigns last year? Wasn't it Samoa Joe? It might have been. That very well might have I, I pretty, been. I, I feel like it was. And then Roman transitioned to Brock Lesnar. Uh, I, I was thinking about this the other day. Roman has been very cool. They've got him on that back burner. And I think they realize, you know, we don't need to continue to push, push, push. They're saving That's why him we've for got Fox. Seth. That's, that's right. what it and, is. And they're waiting, for, they're waiting for that reemergence here. That's what you know leads me to believe we got that slow burn with Seth Rollins over on Facebook, the Hobby and Media discussion group. You know, where they were kind of talking about you know what is up with Seth here. He's coming off as such a douchebag. They were talking about this slow, this slow burn for this turn. It had me thinking: Is the program that we're going towards? I mean, could you see at SummerSlam? Could you see Seth Rollins recapturing the Universal Championship? with assistance from Roman Reigns and you kind of play Becky into this thing. Cause she's already been introduced. If we're going towards a turn with Seth, what does that mean for Becky? Because now they've gone, uh, gone ahead and exposed all that business. If Roman Reigns some kind of somehow inserts himself here, do we get some kind of mega powers play? Are they going to retell that thing with these three? I don't think that you're going to get any kind of a turn from Seth Rollins. You really, all right. So, I mean, he is coming off as such as a total douchebag right now where it seems like it's, it's that slow burn turn. Jugger, are you trying to say that they actually think this is cool? It's working? I think so. I, I, I think that what they are anticipating with Seth Rollins is people are going to turn on Seth Rollins the same way that they turned on John Cena. Like, I, I, I think that they think that Seth Rollins is going to be the face of the company because it can't be Roman Reigns at this point. And Seth Rollins is coming off as a total douchebag because he's coming off as corporate America. So within the sense of Cena, though, Cena actually targeted. Cena never blatantly attacked groups of fans. It was just through his interactions, you know, and through his booking that there was this turn from a certain group but he still held true to those that rode with him. Seth right now is blatantly attacking that, I think that, Vince that, loves smart, it. that social media. I think Vince audience. loves that. I think Vince absolutely loves and is encouraging this. Absolutely. He's coming off as the company man. And if you don't like it, he, because that's because you're too smart for your own fucking good. That's, that's basically the message from Seth Rollins right now. Shut up and eat our shit. But you didn't. You never got that from Cena. You didn't get that from Roman. They stayed true to who they were. I mean, Seth is just coming off it, to put it out there as a straight little bitch. He's almost the evolved version of what we were getting from Sami Zayn when he returned. And I don't. And the reason I didn't particularly like that character. I mean, I, I love that he was. You know, he's trying to generate that heat. But I don't think you need to put a spotlight and attention on these smarts that are going to these shows, thinking you know that they want to be a part of it. They want to take it over. It is about them. I don't think you need to feed that dog. When it starts happening on the TV show, then I'll buy into it. When it's just happening on social media, I I don't I don't put any stock into a Seth Rollins turn at this point. None. Not until it starts happening on TV. It's just and where still I on it. television. He's still playing that that straight baby cookie cutter. And and that's what I'm saying. This this is why I'm pushing for credits. I think it's time to separate the two. 
24-7 rules. There were nine title changes last week on the Raw reunion show. Huckleberry, what did you think of what they did with all the legends? You know what? The, the only, maybe the only individual that won Raw reunion was Gerald Briscoe uh, because he got touched in his special place by the beautiful Kelly Kelly, and then she laid on top of him for three seconds, which is two more seconds than I ever would have needed. Hey, I almost called it. I said there'd be about 10 title changes, but I was I completely missed the boat. I thought, I thought five of those were going to go to the different versions of different faces of Foley. Uh, but, you know, speaking of Foley, maybe the only thing to take away from the Raw reunion was, uh, you know, the interaction between him and The Fiend. The only legend who actually put over a new talent, Mick Foley, ladies and gentlemen. How was Kevin Owens and Stone Cold Steve Austin never on camera together once? How does that happen? We talked. About, hold on, we talked about this. You know, we 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 threw out the pitch last week here in the locker room about how you could have done like a game of pong with the stunners, with you know, with Shane there in the middle, which would have been such a huge segment. People would have been raving about it. That would still be the talk of the town. But I had mentioned to you last week. I said, don't be surprised if they keep these two apart because yes, there are the similarities. They're trying. You know, we're obviously we're evolving Kevin Owens into this like modern day. Stone Cold esque individual, but there are some huge differences between the two of these, between these two individuals, these two talents. Major differences. They are nowhere alike one another. Tonight on Monday Night Raw, you're going to get the man, Becky Lynch, taking on Alexa Bliss, non title, which means Alexa Bliss is going to win. And so much so that inside of the WWE.com article previewing this, it even says that Nikki Cross will be at ringside. Natalia surely is lurking in the shadows, and it probably won't last as a one on one match for very long. It's like you, you know what I'm wondering here. We've got that we've heard the news here that Brett has turned down a Survivor Series appearance. So I'm thinking, you know, who's going to pay for this? Natalia. Her moment for a one-on-one is now gone. They're going to make this thing triple threat, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. But I I feel like the only reason Natalia is in this match is because the match is happening in Toronto. Is that is that safe to say? Yeah, you're trying to play to that that, that home the hometown advantage. Uh, thinking, hey, we're going to give her an opportunity. She's going to shine against Becky Lynch, you know, arguably one of the hottest names in the company in, in professional wrestling. She's going to be out there. She's the challenger. Hey, Uncle Brett, come help us build this thing up. Let's really, let, let's spark this thing. Let's liven it up. Uh, Uncle Brett isn't going to make it. He doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to, you know, work with WWE that weekend. The one that's going to pay for this is Natalia. Do you buy Natalia as a legit contender to Becky Lynch at SummerSlam? I don't buy it at all because we can see right through. We can see right through the facade. The reason that it's happening, we just laid it out there. It's in Toronto. It's in Canada. They're trying to bring in Brett. And if anything, in this division, this, as much as they want to tout this thing, is how impressive it is and the evolution rose above everything, main eventing WrestleMania, that's an absolute joke. You know, outside of... You know, what do you got here? Outside of, you know, how hot Becky is, and that's mainly because of a character that was given to her. There's nothing really special, nothing cool, unique about her. So outside of what do we got here? Outside of Char Char and Rousey, this entire thing is to succumb to just this miserable, pathetic 50-50 booking. You don't know who any of these women are. Nobody is defined as an individual. They're lumped together here in this stupid-ass PR movement that now is, you know, that that the company was behind when you had lady balls have to go out there and promote herself and they're beating their chest about that. But now this thing, this thing has sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Well, we're not to the bottom of the ocean yet, but we're getting there real fast. Let's go ahead and throw things over to SmackDown live. Huckleberry, this is not going to end well. This is not going to end well at all. The King's court returns with special guest Trish Stratus tonight on or tomorrow night excuse me on smackdown live now we're hearing about this rumored match with charlotte at SummerSlam. bailey threw out the challenge on twitter offering trish stratus a shot at the smackdown live women's championship are they gonna do this 
Are they seriously going to have Trish Stratus take the SmackDown Women's Championship from Bayley just to have a match with Charlotte fucking Flair at SummerSlam? All right, so Bayley's challenge was at for, was for SmackDown then, correct? Correct. Or is it just anywhere? No, it's for SmackDown. Okay, well, here's what I'm actually hoping that we're getting a positive twist out of this because immediately what jumped out to me, Bailey, you know, naming her own challengers here, and we've just seen her, you know, she's given the opportunity at SummerSlam to Ember Moon. And you were having this conversation over on Facebook and Homie Media Discussion Group last week. Why does any, why are we supposed to care about Ember Moon? What is special about her? What is, is because she's black? She's got the, you know, she's got these, these different color contacts in. She she likes to play the Twitch. That that's why we're supposed to be invested here. We don't care about what she did at Reality of Wrestling. She's done absolute squats and actually since you know pretty much since joining this company, there hasn't been anything defined with her. I'm hoping they use this to put a little fire under her ass. I hope I hope that she confronts Bailey backstage and says, you know what. You need to worry about me. You gave me this championship opportunity on this grand stage known as SummerSlam, and now I see you're on social media and you're, and you're offering Trish status uh, an opportunity at this. No, this is mine. I'm coming to you for you, Bailey, and I hope she slaps the living shit out of her to let her know that she is in for a fight and Ember Moon is serious about claiming this opportunity, becoming the champion, and elevating herself. I'm hoping we're getting a positive twist out of this thing. Obviously, this entire thing to King's Court, this is the setup for Char Char versus, versus Stratus. But, you know, to me, I have zero interest in this thing. You're giving me this with two weeks build. This should be a marquee anywhere. You want to talk about something that could main event. You're talking about bringing back legends that people actually want to see. This is one of those matches. This is what you would consider a dream match in 2019, wouldn't you? I mean, the crossing of, of eras and legacies and all of this, arguably they're going to go down as two of the best of all time. And you're going to give me two weeks on this? That's absolute bullshit. Oh, I agree that it's absolute bullshit. And again, this plays into we have to sell tickets in Toronto. Let's bring in Trish Stratus and put her against Charlotte Flair. That match will put asses in seats, but it doesn't need the SmackDown Women's Championship. Let's not do that. But do they really want to have three women's matches on SummerSlam? When you look at those visuals, well, come on, it's SummerSlam. This is WrestleMania ass. We're, we're talking about seven hours of program. Oh, fuck, you're right. I mean, this is going to be one of those marathons. So, hell, I mean, we got room. We're probably going to get it, you know, outside of what do we, we've got here. We've got the, the, the special attraction, unless they throw a championship in there with, with Char and in Stratus, you've got the Raw women's, you've got the SmackDown women's. I'm still expecting we're probably going to get a fourth with the, the women's tag team championship on there. God. Yeah, but we've got this seven hour thing. marathon that we've got to fill. New day is going to take on drew McIntyre and Elias. Uh, Rick, this one makes absolutely a zero sense to me as the reigning WWE SmackDown tag team champions look to help Kevin Owens in his crusade against Shane McMahon. Why in the hell would the New Day want to help Kevin Owens? When it was like, what, six weeks ago that Kevin Owens turned on the New Day? Well, you know, they, they did explain this a little bit. Kofi, Kofi made a comment uh, a couple of weeks back about, hey, there's no love lost between the New Day and Kevin Owens. They don't exactly trust them, but they did establish they do have that common enemy. But, hey, let's look at the bigger picture here. What are they foreshadowing? What everyone was talking about, we're looking at this move towards Fox. We're looking at programs for the fall. Why do you think New Day is getting involved in this Kevin Owens mess? Because everything's linking together. Eventually, we're going to get the best in the world, Shane McMahon, taking that championship off of Kofi Kingston. That might be where I draw the line. Uh, Final thing on the run for today, Huckleberry. Finn Balor looks to teach Dolph Ziggler some respect. That's right, because facing Seth Rollins is not enough. Finn Balor also throws up a two-sweet, which means he wants a piece of Dolph Ziggler's ass for how he treated the heartbreak kid. Of course, this is assuming that Finn is out of the hospital, Finn Balor missing the Smackville uh, network event, whatever the hell that was on Saturday, 
because of a illness. That was the undisclosed injury. He's just sick and was in the hospital receiving fluids and stuff. I assume Finn will be clear. Otherwise, they wouldn't be advertising this. But, you know, hey, it's WWE. They advertise shit all the time that doesn't happen. So, hard subject to change. Well, we don't know. We might get a rewrite there at the last minute. I guess there's a rumor that's been going around. Vince just kind of showing up, throwing everything in the trash and, and starting from, from scratch, you know, just hours before the program. And they wonder why, you know, everything's going in every which direction, why nothing's really sticking, nothing's really of interest. Uh, but if, if you're Finn Balor, don't you have more to worry about, bigger issues on your plate than what's going on with Dolph Ziggler and Shawn Michaels? You would think. I mean, Bray Wyatt is kind of stalking Finn Balor at this point. Right, what do you think? Are we going to get I, demon? Kind of deranged? Are we going to get demon versus fiend at SummerSlam? Is that what this is all leading to? Uh, and again, you know, this goes back to what we were just talking about with with Charlotte and Trish Stratus. And, and I guess there is a little bit more history. We never really got that payoff with uh, Pumpkin Demon and and Abigail. I guess we can go back and we can trace our history going all the way back then. Although I'm sure if I'm WWE, I want people to really forget about that. Uh, but this program in itself, it, we've got this rumor that Finn has requested some time off, and I think he absolutely needs it. And, and I mean, there's times I'm very, uh, I'm harsh towards Finn and all that, uh, but I, I know the work, and I know what he means to this company. That he's got that very loyal fan base. He is someone that needs, you know, go away for a little bit, let people miss him, bring him back, put him back with the club there. And, and to me, a program, the demon versus it, it, this the deranged delusional worlds of a Bray Wyatt to me that screams that is over the top WrestleMania moment for me and they're going to force it here at a forced event in this SummerSlam I'm fine with the Fiend beating Finn Balor I just don't think he should beat the Demon at least not at SummerSlam man like you said it's just too quick you know Bray, Bray, Bray showed up and beat him up like Big deal. Like, he's not in his head. Not enough to warrant the demon. And, and I guess if, if they want to trace back, you know, to the history of these guys, we never got that payoff. I, I, can, I can understand that. But to me, for this moment, this, needs, this thing needs to feel new and fresh. It, it needs a great build. It needs to get some history behind it, get people invested in this thing. But, again, you know, it's six months of booking in six minutes, and that's a, sadly, that's a norm with WWE. Just have Bray Wyatt take Finn out. Finn's out for a couple months. He comes back and attacks Bray Wyatt. All systems are go. So that's going to wrap things up for this week's show. Thanks for listening. And if you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button. Then head over to wherever the simulcast is, whether it be hittingthemarks.com or hackerhameen.podbean.com. Visit our friends over at thegorillaposition.com as they tell the story of some pro wrestling storytellers. Make sure that you visit Jamie over at lastwordonprowrestling.com for all the news that is news from around the world of pro wrestling. You can find me across all social media platforms at not Jargo RBV. How do the peeps, the freaks, and the geeks find you? Well, as always, you can keep up with all things Rick Victory across all social media platforms at the real RBV. If anybody happens to be around the Cincinnati area this evening, this isn't going to make a lot of sense to, to the listeners out there, but I'm going down to a very special event, a very special little festival setting. I get it. They discontinued it. There was this classic restaurant here called Sandy's, and it was a Sandy Burger. Essentially, what it was, it was like a half pound White Castle. And they went away when I was young. Uh, the the owners, the creators, they're coming out one night only. They're hosting an event. They're going to have those burgers. Man, I'm so looking forward to that. My God, just thinking about a half pound White Castle makes me feel like I have to go take a shit. That's it for this week's show. We'll talk to you this weekend. For now, we're off like a prom dress. See ya! Watch your fingers. Enable me. Don't give up. I'll be your bad guy. Stop, stop. Go! Your kind, break the couple's head, don't stop it, down it.
Oaxaca.